All right. Good morning, everyone. I just hope that my slides is up, please. Well, in, in any case, I want to talk about following what uh, Anthony has said. Excuse me, is my slide on? Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'll be speaking on global warming and what do they mean by global warming as using all the thermometer data that is somewhat not good. And then we will try to explain whether the interpretation of this warming is either mostly human caused or mostly natural. Are they, which one is it, right? And uh, my name is Willie Soon. I'm a scientist at the series-sign.com. Before I start, I want to acknowledge uh, my two colleagues from Ireland, Dr. Ronan and Michael Connolly, for helping me put together this slide set. First thing is about IPCC, obviously, right? <clears throat> they make a lot of claims. But as you can imagine, from one to five, right? Global warming is there, is warm by 1.5 C or three degree Fahrenheit, so on and so forth, and it cannot be explained by the sun, so on and so forth. And then, but the obvious one is basically claiming that the contamination of the thermometer data, let's say by urban heat island effect, is less than 10%. Those things are open to challenge, and you can prove them wrong by just even turn around. I mean, that's how simple it is, and that's why it's embarrassing for IPCC to make that kind of claim. But this is how they, they try to tell everyone that, you know, if you look at the data set, right, the solid line is the observed temperature record. Never mind what it is, we'll explain later. And then they say that if I were to try to simulate in computer climate model using only volcano and the sun, which is the green uh, lines, uh, well, it won't fit. If we add CO2, it fit. Problem solved. Everything's done, so let's all go home and stop the funding, right? So I'm going to talk about this uh, subject matter. It's quite a lot to cover in 20 minutes, obviously, but then uh, I hope you understand that you don't have to rush and uh, somehow the, the, the website doesn't appear, but uh, please, you can get all the slides at uh, series.sign.com slash post slash ICCC15, okay? And uh, we will actually speak about all these issues and clearly shows that IPCC is beyond a you know, good standard of science. The first stage is I want to talk about the history of how global land temperature is constructed. There are six stages. The first stage is basically the simple stage from Vladimir uh, uh, Koppen and uh, Edward Bruckner and even uh, Clue, uh, Homer Clue from uh, US Weather Service asking a very simple question. Does the globe, you know, the temp climate change? I mean, the answer is obvious. Climate does change, right? And then second stage is very clear is in uh, 1930s to 1940s. There are folks like uh, Joe, uh, Joseph Kinzer, actually also from US Weather Service. They clearly started to collect all this data worldwide based on the Smithsonian weather records. And they found that, yeah, the globe seems to be warming. And then there are guys from England named Guy Calendar. By the way, he's Canadian also. And uh, he realized that, wow, this could be all blamed uh, by uh, rising of carbon dioxide. And then there are Third stage, which is 1940 to 1970s, right? Global cooling, basically. They realized that the warming that they observed earlier didn't continue. It's, the globe appears to be cooling slightly, right? And uh, you can see that one of the effects of the temperature record is basically by now, a lot of things has been gone into this mix. They've been adjusting and readjusting, and then somehow the cooling part seems to disappear a bit, right? We'll explain exactly in details after that what happened. And then fourth stage is basically global warming is finally here. Let's stop mincing words and then greenhouse effect is here. This is, of course, the testimony of James Hansen in the hot summer of June 1988, right? Everyone got panicked. IPCC got formed. The world appears to be very, very scared now about this temperature warming that is only like one degree, two degrees Celsius. I mean, boom, that's 10 degree right there, hot. Fifth stage. War against climate skeptics, obviously. They say, well, urban, urbanization bias is not a problem at all. The raw data is not reliable, so we must homogenize them. We must adjust them in some way. And then, of course, there's no hiatus in global warming. This is a topic that's been gone over many times in this conference. And then, of course, it ended in a very clear situation where we see a lot of manipulation going on. It's called climate gate. Look it up, of course. We, we, if you want, we can discuss this later. But sixth stage, science is settled, guys. No more 
challenge, no more ability to even ask a simple question, how good are the thermometer record? That's what we'll do today, by the way. The only reason why I stand up here is that we work very hard. This is a cumulative experience of at least 50 years of learning. Trying to tell you that you can take this message, take this slide, go and talk to everyone, your neighbor. First of all, start with your family, right? Your children, your grandchildren, and tell them, explain to them why this global warming thing is not so clear in that sense. So, how reliable are the raw station records? Anthony has shown you a lot of good examples, right? Changes in, in, in instrumentation, how you measure them. The obvious one is this step change. There are two types of changes that I think are worth discussing. Step change, which is one-time change that has nothing to do with climate, but the temperature started to warm or cool, right? And then you have trend biases, more systematic type, like slowly building up of an urban city, right? And those are the effects that is much harder to correct for, but we will start with the, the, the step biases. This is one of the examples from, uh, from, from Austria, right? Uh, Crime uh, Munster station in, in Austria. It's actually a rural station. From the 18, 1767 until now, they actually have a record that measures outside the window, right? It's about seven meters up. And then 1980, they moved down to 2.2 meters on the ground. They used the Stevenson screen uh, 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 station that, that uh, Anthony was uh, criticizing just now. And then you can look at this data. The, the data from the early period was there, and then boom, right? They make measure from, from the old way, and then the new way, temperatures start warming up. Those things really need to be corrected if we want to study them correctly. So it's, it, they are right in some sense that we do have to correct for the raw data, but one has to do it very carefully. Of course, the good system that Anthony just discussed could be also very useful. And then the well-known effect of urban heat island effect. This is very well-known. In the inner city, it's much, much warmer than outside, okay? And indeed, this is a human caused uh, kind of climate change, really. But has not, it's a local change, has nothing to do with rising carbon dioxide in a sense, right? And this phenomenon of urban heat island has been well known by, by the English meteorologist by the name of Luke Howard in 1820s. You already realized in the phenomenon in London, right? Versus outskirts of London. And then this is one of the prime examples. You can see on, the, on your uh, left, it's basically Paris and then Singapore. The temperature change there from inner city to the outskirts is up to 5C, okay? This is way beyond any global warming signal that you are looking for. And then my two colleagues, Ronan and Michael Connolly in 2014, many people have done this, by the way, but they are the ones that independently do this work. Look at the, what they call GHCN, which is the Global Historical Climatology Network, right? That is uh, collected by NOAA, looking at the version 3 data, and then looking into US, which has the most station, 1,200 of them. Separate them into, you know, the, ru the, the rural station and then the intermediate and the most urban one. And then compare them. Here's what happened. At the top graph, you will see is the urban station and then middle is basically the rural. If you subtract the two, you can see the warming trend of, net warming trend of 0.5 degrees per century. That's a lot. For those who know this, this kind of graph, this data set already correct for the non-climatic bias called the time of observation bias. If you don't correct for that, it's actually 0.7C. Okay, it's a huge per century. So that's a big, big signal. And then one example that they know very well, my two colleagues from Ireland, so Valencia Observatory. In 1867 to 1892, those measurements were way out in the Valencia Island, off the coast of, uh, of uh, Ireland, right? And then in 1892 to 2001, they moved slightly inland. And then by 2001, they moved all the way 250, 350 meter inland. And then the elevation was up 20 meters higher. So clearly that we have good station history. I want to promote that we need to have that information. Okay? And from here, you can see there are four major changes during this, this time period. And a lot of them needs to worry about. We need to have a full record of this. So my colleague collected all this data. So we started to propose the idea that why don't we start looking at the rural station. We started to propose something like construct rural island, rural US, rural China, rural Arctic, for example. So that's what we're trying to do here. This is the example of island. And then you can see on your left is the island and then the US uh, rural station. The US station got the most data, so the trend really don't look like the global warming signal that you see. Rural China, and then also Arctic. Arctic is much, much harder. We search very deep. For four years, we look for any station history data that is available. No one was wanting to give us or work with us and so on and so forth, but we have success in Europe, so we'll tell you that in a minute. And these are all the stations that we have collected. So what we do is that let's average them and look at what they look like. 
at the top panel, you can see is the rural station over Northern Hemisphere. Okay, it's completely slightly different uh, 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 trend and structure, as you can see. But if you add urban station to this particular four region, guess what happened? You've got a warming trend that looked very similar to the IPCC kind of curve. Okay, and then uh, here on your left again, we take all the GACN data and average them to show you that you get this signal that very similar to IPCC proposed. And what we're trying to propose is that, look, let's consider the rural station only data. And you can see even from this simple exercise, you already proved beyond doubt that the IPCC claimed that the urban heat island effects is less than 10% is completely wrong. It's at least 40% right here, okay, from this estimate. And then this is what I mean. Can we actually recover what they estimate? We put some five or six group of, of what you call construction of the rural and urban station. This is where the part of the tricks. When they construct this station, they put all of them together, and then you show this warming trend that is very clear, and then we can recover the same signal. What we're asking them, can we look at the rural only station, right? So quickly, if we compare these two data sets with, let's say, <coughs> oceans and climate proxy, what happened? This is, uh, this is actually the ocean data. This is the three ring proxy. This is another proxy from the glacial length. You can see even from this result, by the way, it's quite interesting to show this result. No one even plot this out before us. In some sense, it's kind of weird, isn't it, right? But it shows you that actually there are some problem in the thermometer record that they are proposing. So I want to quickly update GHCN version three to version four, right? And we have actually been working on version four. Version four is not completely dead yet. By the way, the pr problem still persists. No history, station history uh, uh, metadata available. But we, we found a colleague, Peter O'Neill from Ireland, that was able to work with us. And when we already published paper talking about all this problem in the thermometer data. So GACN data is also similar to GACN4, but then a lot more data. They have about 20. 20 to 30,000 more stations. Uh, GSCN version 3 is only 7,000 stations, right? But most of the stations are really in the uh, southern, uh, uh, northern hemisphere. There's no data at all from southern hemisphere. And here's one example of what the NOAA results are showing. This is a paper published by NOAA group. The first thing we want to start is the version 3 with the urban and rural, non-homogenized, unmolested. So they show this temperature curve that looks quite interesting. It's warming straight. And then if you study, well, this is the end point. Uh, it's important to point out. And then if you were to study the effect right, of changing from version 3 to version 4, what happened? A lot more station, far a lot more station. The modern period warmer than the version 3. Version 4 is slightly warmer. And then the past cool. Okay? So it looked even steeper. And then very quickly, if you look at the effect from, from uh, without homogenization, the version 3 to version 4, there's much smaller effect. But the main effect here is basically after you homogenize them, version 3 and version 4 look virtually identical. Okay? It shows you the effect of homogenization. And it will explain the problem. There are two problems that we will show very quickly. So now, surprisingly, indeed, from version 3 and version 4, it's not important at all. Even if you add like 15,000 more stations, it doesn't make any difference right? from their averaging. But why does the homogenization add warming? That's the key question. And we want to explain this, this problem, of course. It's called urban blending, so we'll come to that in a minute. But IPCC, NOAA, uh, uh, GIS, and you know, England, they've been promoting this. We must only use the homogenized data, okay? which is really not a good idea, actually. That's what we want to propose in this talk. So give a quick example of what happened. This is what we did. We actually systematically look at the station history, correct for it as accurate as we can, according to the recorded uh, history. Here's what we found out. This is the first paper we published in 2015. Remember, it's already eight years, okay? We found out that every time they, 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 they change this data, homogenize, update the data, every time the recommendation adjustment changes. So five or six examples here. That is something very fishy, isn't it? Because every time you change, it should be the same. You shouldn't change the record. This is something very suspicious, and we already published this and talked to all those people, tell them to do it. Nobody do anything about it, obviously. Like, like Anthony said, they don't really care, right? So we need a larger sample. So we studied that, that one for, for, for Ireland, the Valencia Observatory. So now we meet Peter O'Neill. Thank God for Peter O'Neill. You know what happened to Peter O'Neill? He collected a lot of version of their update. Every time they update the GSCN version 3, version 4, he collected. Every month, he have one data set. This is the amount of data that he has, version that he has collected. For version 3, he have almost 1,900 of them. 
You, uh, you understand how important this is? <laughs> I mean, don't, don't even keep them. We have them all. And then 1,800 of them, we got this for version 4. Look at what happened. We, we are able to publish a paper last year with the whole group of meteorologists from, from Europe. So Europe, we started to see whether how much station history we can get. Okay, so this is a very interesting paper. And here, the red dot showing the station where we have meta station history. 259 for version 3, 850 for version 4. By the way, it's only 20 to 30% of the total available station. It tells you that we're not able to do this big analysis yet. But the whole point is that we're beginning to have some hope here. So you ask a very simple question. How well is the adjustment? It's only 17% of this adjustment make any sense at all. It's applied consistently. And then if you check the adjustment according to the station history, because we have them, we can show that less than 20% of them agree with uh, actual history because the rest of it is artificial. It's all nonsense. That's why we want to tell you that we have worked on this problem. It's called urban blending problem that is very, very serious, okay? Please look for a minute. This is a very important problem that no one even talk about. No one obviously want to run away from all this problem. To start that, I want to illustrate this simple example. Remember, take a deep breath. You can actually get this slide and study for yourself, but I want to quickly go over this. In the, imagine this. Pure world that no global warming, only urban warming. Station one, we have a station that have moderately warming, no bias, no other bias. Station B is rural, have a step change. Station C is basically similar as station A, but then it has a, a cooling bias, okay, in a step jump in, in uh, 1985. Station four, very heavily urbanized, like station C, but then more urbanized, it has a step change. So if you look at this step one, what they do is that they compare, let's say that we want to homogenize everything according to station A, okay, that is slightly urbanized, right? And then you can see you compute the difference, and then you can quickly apply the adjustment. This is what happened, the end result. But the question is that, is this correct? We want to illustrate the example that, look at the station B, which is a very clear example. If you correct it, if you correct this thing correctly, it should be no warming trend at all because it has no warming. It has only a slight shift in the cooling if you do, should do that. But because you mix it with other stuff, you actually have a warming trend of 0.7 degree, which is really large. It's true, the most urbanized one on the right-hand side, station D, is showing that the, the most warming trend from 3 degree is reduced to 2.2. Okay, that's a very interesting, but people keep forgetting the more important problem is the contamination of the rural station. And this is what happened in consequence of urban blending. They are drinking too much smoothie, strawberry and banana smoothie. And they forgot that, you know, you can never get the banana flavor back and the, the strawberry flavor back. And that's the problem of homogenization data. So please, tell people about this problem. Urban blending is a very serious problem. And here, real world example, in Beijing, 10 station, published by He and Jia in 2012, and we reported this back in 2018 in our paper, that we show you, if you quantify these 10 station according to the degree of urbanization bias, very, very urbanized, very, very high warming trend. Low, less urbanized, low warming trend, okay? And then if you correct for the homogenization, look what happened. The most urban one gets slightly cooler, Less warming trend, but it's the urban, the rural one all get warmer. This is the contamination process. Again, this is not talk. This is proof that they have problem, and they should admit this problem, isn't it? So what should be done instead? There are a lot of proposals. By the way, we wrote words after words. We published quite a few papers now, and of course, they keep ignoring it. But in the meantime, I want to propose us to look at rural northern hemisphere, which is more climatically representative to study the cause, okay? And then we got to study this based on, uh, instead of homogenized uh, rural and urban. Again, remember this curve? We know now the reason why their curve is kind of not good is that because this observed temperature curve is contaminated by urban heat island effect and urban blending, isn't it? But when they run the model, does they, do they get the sun correct? Actually, I want to propose to you, obviously it's not correct. This is what happened. This is the basic and embarrassment of solar physics. My apologies to all my colleagues. We've been working for this for at least 30 to 40 years now, right? This is the direct measurement from satellite. You put a radiometer up there, you try to measure how much the light output has changed. Just the absolute scale, the difference between the, the 10 or so measurements that I put here is from 1360 to 1372 watt per meter square. That's a difference of 12 watt per meter square. Doubling of CO2 gives you 4 watt per meter square. It tells you that this problem is not resolved in a serious problem. And the question is this, how do you combine them together? This is what happened that you can do this. You can have three options at least that we can think of. 
The first option on the left is promoted by IPCC, it's called the PMOD, the Swiss group. And the middle one is actually the Royal Meteorological Institute of Belgium, and the right-hand side is called the ACRIM. Each of them will have consequence, depends on which one you pick and how you combine them. Here's the example. You have cooling, you have cooling, and then you get slightly interesting. Almost there, don't worry about it. I'm cool, I'm cool. And then now, here's the thing, right? You look at what IPC say. They use urban and rural station, and then they use the PMOD data. Obviously, they're right, isn't it? Can we give a round of applause? IPCC win. Now, let's go to ours. Let's propose the rural only. Let's use a, a cream calibration. Look what happened. Can they say that they rule this out scientifically? I'm sorry, it's nonsense. Goodbye, IPCC. <laughs> I mean, here's the problem. So very quickly, I only tell you two papers out of the 17 papers we published so far from Series Science. Sorry, a little bit promotion of Series Science, okay? Our, our first paper by Series Science was actually cited by IPCC AR6 in 2021. They claim that we agree with them. So it's an embarrassment for them, of course. We can easily point out that it's wrong. We actually was evaluating the Northern, uh, Northern Hemisphere snow cover changes. We found that all four of them are disagreeing with the climate model and they say that we agree with them on two. That's what they're trying to do. They cover up the other two, which is really not right. And then, just quickly, a plug. Look, half time. IPCC score one. Even when we're playing on this slanted field, we score a goal myself, right? Actually, Ronan did it, not me. But uh, we were playing defense all the time. This is the problem. And science has been so bad. If you learn anything, please, again, please look at the slide as series.sign.com slash post slash ICCC15. Our funding really comes from people from you to donate and don't tell us what to do, actually. If you trust me, you give me $10 or $100, you'll be helping science, not helping Anthony Fauci. I'm, I won't send the money to Anthony Fauci. So thank you very much for your attention. And, and uh, yeah, please help science and please help support Heartland Institute also. Thank you.